I don't want to obviously um, date myself because I'm only 27. I'm going to be 28 next, next month. Um, I went on one of the first tours uh, in the country, and this was a tour where we had Fat Boys, LL Cool J, Run DMC, Big Daddy Kane, and we went around the country. And I was a roadie, and I was pushing speakers on the tour, not doing any odd job. But we would all get our clothes from New York, and we would basically take them down and tailor them, and you know maybe put a pin tuck in it, shorten the late, shorten something here, change this and that. The kids wanted to buy the clothes off my back, and. I, I, I just found it amazing that it was just a regular pair of Levi's, I just added a stitch to it, but they wanted to buy the clothes off my back. And I said, you know what? This is a bigger life than just music. And there is something else around this life. Uh, you know, I came back to New York and you know, I started working odd jobs. I, I've been working since 10 years old, everything from shoveling snow to you know, wiring BX cable as an apprentice. Um, and I said to my mother, you know what? I want to create a company that that I sell clothes out there to, these, to the youth market. And she said, well, the only way you're gonna do that is you have to learn to sew clothes. And she sent me down a block to somebody who had a, a tailoring shop. And I asked that person, can I apprentice for that person? And that person let me apprentice for the next two years. And I didn't get paid for it, but they let me apprentice. And that person, Tim, he mentored me for another two years and taught me the ideals and, and some of the basics about sewing garments. Now, food didn't start at that time, but I had that knowledge in my back pocket, and thank you, and I thank him that he allowed me to study within his workshop, because he was a busy enough man as is, and he didn't have time to teach, but he found the time to teach me. Now, what happened after that was, this music started to get really, really strong and powerful and popular, and everybody started loving it. Now, an executive at Timberland said at one time, said, listen, you know what? We don't sell our boots to drug dealers. And this is important, again, because it goes back to that same guy in the bike shop. He didn't respect the fact that African Americans, Latinos, and inner city kids were buying his product. He didn't care. He believed that we were all drug dealers at that point. Now, if you know Timberland, Timberland builds the best boot in the world. And if you're somebody who is a mountain climber or a construction worker, you're buying one pair of Timberland every two years or three years because literally they make the best boot in the world. But if you're somebody who lives in hip hop or you're buying it for a fashion aspect and not a functionality aspect, as soon as you get a scuff, you're buying a new pair. So you're buying three to four pair a month. So now you're 80% of their business. And meanwhile, they're trying to address and they're trying to advertise to 20% of their business. And, and that created the anger in the community for me to create the words B-U-F-U. -U. I started a new line called Bufu, B-U-F-U. -U. And the next day, I sewed that on some hats, sewed it on some shirts, and I went outside and I was hanging out with my new B-U-F-U -U shirts, my Bufu shirts. And I remember walking down the block and the kid said to me, Hey, yo, I like that. What is that? I said, oh, Bufu, B-U-F-U. He said, oh, really? I didn't know you were into that stuff. Oh, you know, what's up? We're hanging out? And then I realized what Bufu stood for at that moment. So I decided to change the name from Bufu to Fubu. I don't think you guys might have gotten that. But anyway, not that I have any problem with that. I'm in the fashion business, but um, I decided to change that name. Um, at that point, what I did was, I went to somebody who was a friend of mine, who was LL Cool J, and I said to him, I said, L, I need to get this product on to every video and to every superstar in the country. How do I do that? He said, here's what you gotta do. You gotta go to Russell, you gotta go to Houdini, you gotta go to one of these guys, and you gotta stalk them, and you gotta make sure that they know that you're serious, because nobody wants to help pull you up the ladder if they don't believe that you're serious about what you wanna do. And you have to stalk these guys, and never let them down, and never let them breathe. Stalk them. So I decided the next day to set up camp on his lawn and start stalking LL, because he was the only one I really knew that well. Um, needless to say, he finally came out the house, I think about a, two days later. And, you know, I was out there with my camera crew and my boys. And I put the hat on him and I said, you know what? I really need this from you. And he said, you know, 
I'm going to help you and I'm going to walk you through this. And I'm going to guide your hand through this. But if I get somewhere with this product for you and you get somewhere, we're going to do the same thing Nike, Nike has done with Michael Jordan. And I'm going to be your, your Michael Jordan of Nike as long as you give me that promise. And he did exactly what he said he would do. LL then went on and wore it in countless videos, put me on video sets with a lot of people, and he did what we today call is one of the biggest advertising coups in history, where he put in a Gap commercial, he wore a FUBU hat, and he said in the Gap commercial, for us, by us, on the low. And the Gap spent about $30 million advertising that commercial, and people really thought it was a Gap commercial, but they thought it was really a FUBU commercial at the same time. Um, you know, and that was, that was a very, very, that was as they call the tipping point of my career, and it was all attributed to LL. And funny thing is, The Gap fired 30 of their executives and the whole agency after they realized what had happened. <laughs> but, you know, uh, not taking anything away from them, you know what they did realize, they realized the power of the African-American dollar and they realized that their store sales spiked 200% after that was aired because FUBU wasn't large enough and everybody and every African American and Hispanic in the country thought they can go to the Gap and find it. So they re-aired the commercial a year later and spent $60 million re-airing it because they realized the power of our dollar. So I guess they could say kudos to us. But, um, you know, that was my story coming up and and, and, you know, I don't want to forget the fact that after FUBU started, I took on three other partners, and there was the four FUBU guys. So as we were going through the challenging times, where it was those three, four years where we didn't know if there was ever going to be a dollar made, we never thought we would get to be any kind of corporation or global business. We thought that hopefully we'd have maybe a boutique that we could sell our product in. Every single one of us wanted to quit every single week, and it was the other guy who would say, you just can't do it, man. You can't do it. Because we were still doing something we loved. And we kept pulling each other up the ladder at that point. And your partners that you get in life, whether it's in your relationship or a personal relationship or a business relationship, those are going to be the people that are going to hold you up when those times get hard. And those are the people who are going to help you see the vision when you have a lot of fog and a lot of burr clouding your, 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 your streams of thoughts. And those guys helped me all the way up until we got to a level where we said, you know what, we're going to go national with this. Now, Gap is in everything, you know, FUBU is in everything in the Gap. We're in all these commercials. We went to the bank. We got turned down 27 times. But you know what, we're going to go out to Vegas to a trade show in Vegas. And this trade show is called the Magic Show in Vegas. And this is where we sell all our goods to all the stores. We didn't have enough money to stay in the convention center. So we stayed in a hotel room five miles away from the convention center. But what happened was we sent out that ad and that picture of LL Cool J to all the stores in the country. And in that little room, we wrote $300,000 worth of orders. Now, we were amazed. Now